Next, I'd like to invite uh, Jackie Courtney to talk to about the uh, Gilbert's Pod Rule Action Group. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just um, start with just put myself in a little bit of context. Um, today, I'm talking to you as the um, communications officer for the Gilbert's Pod Rule Action Group, but. Um, a couple of years out of my PhD as a young scientist in the late 90s, I was privileged to be employed um, to run the on-ground project for the Gilbert's Pottery recovery, which was only shortly after it was rediscovered. And I did that job for about two and a half years, and then it was decided to turn that into a permanent position for a more senior staff member within the Department of Conservation and Land Management. Um, so I've remained on the recovery team ever since. So. I've been on the Gilbert's Pottery Recovery Team for nearly 22 years, but um, I've only actually been heavily involved with the Gilbert's Pottery Action Group it's, itself for about two years and their communications officer for about just, over, well, just under a year. So a lot of what I'll be talking to you today about what Gilbert's Pottery Action Group has done, I can't actually take any credit for. Oops, not press that too hard. So Gilbert's Potteroo is a small marsupial in the family Potteroidae, which is a relative of the kangaroo family. Adults range in size from 900 to 1200 grams, so it's quite a small animal. It's one of the most highly fungivorous mammals in the world, with over 90% of the diet made up of fungal material, mostly from the fruiting bodies of underground hypogeal fungi, or native truffles. It was first collected for science by John Gilbert in 1840, and the species was scientifically described by John Gould in 1841 and given the scientific name Potteroas gilberti in honour of John Gilbert. But of course the Noongar people from the southwest of Western Australia um, already had a name for it and they call it Nilgite. Gilbert's pottery was only collected infrequently until the 1870s and was noted as probably extinct by Shortridge in 1909. But despite a survey being conducted in the 70s, and not finding it, it was rediscovered at Two People's Bay, which is on the south coast of Western Australia, just um, east of Albany, um, by then PhD student Elizabeth Sinclair. The risk of a catastrophic fire wiping out the entire population at Two People's Bay was recognised and written into the interim management guidelines within two months of the rediscovery. Um, the species occurs in very dense, long unburnt vegetation, and the fear was that a single spark would lose the whole lot and we'd have no, the species would be gone. So for the first 10 years after the rediscovery, which included my two and a half years on the project, the main focus was to search for additional populations outside of Two People's Bay, see if there were any other undiscovered populations, attempt to establish a captive breeding colony because that had worked quite well with long-nosed potteroos and with other species, numbats and dibblers and so on, to be able to use those animals to then reintroduce into the wild, um, and also to research the ecology of the species. But when it became apparent that neither captive breeding nor assisted reproductive techniques were going to produce a sufficient population of captive bred animals, Parks and Wildlife staff established populations on Bald Island, which is just off the coast near, Alban near um, Two People's Bay, um, using animals from Two People's Bay, and that project began in 2005 and um, in a 380 hectare fenced enclosure at the Wachinakup National Park, and that started in 2010. Additional threats to the animals include feral predators, cats and foxes particularly, native, native pythons in the Wachinakup enclosure, which um, once you take the foxes and cats out, the pythons have a field day, um, and the genetic risks inherent in just small populations. Current estimated population of Gilbert's Potteroo is around 80 to 90 individuals and that's divided between the three locations. Bald Island has a population of about 60, and the Wachinakup enclosure and, the two peoples, and Two Peoples Bay make up the rest. It's listed as critically endangered on the IUCN Red List under the EPBC Act and under the WA Wildlife Conservation Act. So the Gilbert's Potter Action Group was um, incorporated in March 2002 following a public meeting the previous end of the previous year. And they had three goals, which was to raise funds to assist in the recovery of Gilbert's Potteroo, to provide responsible information to promote local, national, international awareness, and to encourage volunteers to assist in the Gil Gilbert's Potteroo research and recovery program. So over the past 15 years, GPAG have raised about $150,000 for Gilbert's Potteroo recovery actions, equipment, 
helicopter trips when they're doing translocations to Bald Island um, and to support the GPA Games through a range of fundraising activities and small grants. And we also have a mascot, for, that's Gilby. Um, awareness raising, um, we, the group have developed school educational PowerPoint presentation with associated discussion questions activities. They've got information brochures funded by a Lotteries West grant. They do media interviews um, and they do stalls at various threatened species events and festivals. They sell merchandise at cruise to cruise ships and also at these various events. And both the fundraising and the awareness raising have been very successful in terms of um, you know, raising $150,000 from a small group. The group itself currently has 51 paid up members and five committee members, so it's a, it's a very small group. In the first 10 years of the recovery project, while the captive colony was still active and there was still hope of finding another mainland population, Citizen scientists, both before GPAG formed and once GPAG had formed, helped with surveying for underground fungi at Two People's Bay to match the fruiting bodies of the fungi with the spores found in Potteroo scats to look at diet. Searching for new populations outside of Two People's Bay using hair tubes and arches and then analysing the hair. Um, is doing more direct um, management work with the captive colony, for example, changing, digging out the sand in the, in the enclosures and replacing it with fresh sand to minimise disease, um, feeding of captive animals, helping with the handling of the captive animals for health monitoring, and collecting underground fungi for diet supplementation. So that's just an example of people collecting fungi um, and some of, the, some of the fungal variety that, that can be found. Gilbert's pottery eats at least 80 different species of underground fungi, so native truffles, most of which are undescribed to science. Then in 2000, November 2015, our worst nightmare happened and um, Two People's Bay was struck by a severe um, thunderstorm, uh, lightning storm, and um, over a number of days, huge efforts were made to try and protect the bay, but 90% of Gilbert's pottery habitat was destroyed. This is just a picture of the, the Two People's Bay, um, Mount Gardner headland immediately after the fire. It's just devastated. So 90% of the habitat was destroyed. Between half and two thirds of the potteroos known to be alive at the time of the fire have not been seen since. Currently we only know of five animals living in remnant vegetation and only one joey has been found in the two years since the fire. The critical importance then of the Bald Island insurance population that had been created in 2005 for the survival of the species was demonstrated um, and the creation of additional safe haven populations then be became extremely urgent. In March 2017, um, the federal government Threatened Species Recovery Fund gave Gilbert's Pottery Action Group $250,000 to help create a new safe haven population while Two People's Bay recovers from the 2015 fire. Now remembering that we're a small community group, <laughs> um, that's a huge amount of money to suddenly be granted and the work is being undertaken by Parks and Wildlife staff but in partnership with the Gilbert's Pottery Action Group. So Threatened Species Recovery Hub research project on citizen science involvement in threatened species has noted that many threatened species do not occur in urban areas where the greatest pool of potential participants um, live. But this isn't really an issue for Gilbert's Pottery because it's so endangered and people are so excited to have the opportunity to be able to go and see an animal that most people in their wildest dreams would never have the opportunity to see, that people travel 500 kilometres from Perth to come down to Albany to volunteer for a week, trapping, you know, helping with the trapping monitoring. Threatened species may be sensitive or vulnerable to the potential disturbance of direct monitoring, and that is definitely an issue for Gilbert's Potteroo. But Gilbert's Potteroo has some specific challenges. It's relatively small, it's cryptic, it's nocturnal, it's silent, and it lives in very dense, long unburnt vegetation. So the opportunities for citizen scientists to actually be involved in, in studying that animal are really, really limited. You, you, it's on conservation reserves. It doesn't breed well in captivity. It doesn't survive well or breed in captivity, so you can't see it in a zoo or captive colony. 
Um, it's critically endangered. You don't want to be doing anything to disturb it. And it occurs only on conservation land in remote, inaccessible areas like on Bald Island um, or in the highly managed enclosure at Wachinakup. So how can citizen science be involved since the fire? As um, Karen um, Cooper talked about this morning, there can be contributory <laughs> projects which are designed by scientists and basically just the, the people just go along, help out with the trapping, record the data and then go home. Um, and to a large extent that's, that's what happens, is that people go and help and then that's the level, level extent of their involvement. Collaborative, they're designed by scientists but participants are involved in more than one stage of the scientific process and that's what we were doing when we were doing the hair arching and looking for animals and, and studying the, the hair, and identifying the hair. And then there's the final type, is the co-created projects, which are designed collaboratively. Scientists and participants or communities work together in partnership, and at least some of the volunteer participants are included in most or all steps of the scientific process. We haven't done that yet, and we're hoping that that's what we can do. So why does it matter? As mentioned, finding volunteers to participate in remote field work isn't a problem. But with federal government funding increasingly being channelled through community groups like the $250,000 grant, there is a need to find ways to encourage volunteers to become involved in all aspects of the work of the community group and not just the field work. People can go volunteer with parks, go out, play with the Potteroo, go home, but you've still got the community group there frantically applying for grants, doing awareness raising, trying to raise money, keep things going because that's where the money's coming. So people want to do the field work. They don't want to fundraise, raise awareness or write and manage grants, but that work's essential. So as we discussed in this Engaging Citizens section yesterday, volunteers are more likely to become committed long-term to a project if they have some control and personal involvement in the design of projects. And the challenge for GPAG and our partners in Park and Wildlife is to design projects that are either collaborative or preferably co-created so that people have some sense of ownership and we've got some ideas, um, analysing camera trap footage from Mount Gardner as it recovers from the fire to look for potteroos that we don't know, that we haven't found, or look at monitor cat and fox presence, do flora surveys to assess post-fire recovery, assessing fungi in the burnt and unburnt areas, um, assessing vegetation impact on, of quokkas in the Wachina Cup enclosure, radio tracking potteroos in the Wachina Cup enclosure to assess python impact, involving students in work integrated learning to work with GPAG members and learning thus about managing volunteers and community groups because that's something they're going to need to know if they're going to be working in, in threatened species recovery. Increasingly that sort of money is coming through community groups. They need to know how to work with community groups. Um, or in the office helping with social media, website upgrades and information or working with Duke of Edinburgh Award students for their community service component. So Gilbert's Pottery is small, brown, cryptic, nocturnal and silent, and so it's really up against it as far as public support is concerned, compared to other more charismatic, visible, colourful or noisy endangered species. But with government funding increasingly being directed to community groups, finding ways to encourage and maintain public involvement and commitment is an essential challenge that needs to be resolved for the continuation of GPAG into the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Jackie.